Okay, I, I'm going to take a little detour here because I want to teach you, teach you something. Um, and then I'm going to continue talking on this slide. Okay, this is actually Tiffany's dissertation. She graduated two years ago, nearly three years ago. And this is actually part of a longer story. Maybe 2012, 2011, I, get, I got a call from Belgium from a lady called Mike Jans. And Mike is, was a PhD student at Hasselt University in Belgium. And she said, uh, can you guide my dissertation on process mining and auditing? And uh, I said, let me have a look at it. And I didn't know what process mining was. And then I, I kind of looked at the literature. She gave me some pointers. And I found this work by the guy called Will van der Waals. And he's based computer scientist. And his idea was that you could extract data, what they are called logs from ERP systems, like SAP and Oracle, and basically track transactions in corporate systems. And that made me think about the old days whereby we took a random sample of numbers, went to a file cabinet, uh, picked up those, those invoices, and then we compare those, uh, and then we look at the tracking sheet in the invoices. Basically, it was something stamped there, and that would be this one went from Abby to Miklos, then this went from Miklos to Nick, then went to Nick to Claudia in such and such a day, and then Claudia sent it back to Abby, and et cetera, et cetera. So it was a kind of attack. Started thinking, and I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Let's have a look at that. So we actually looked at it, and Mika did got data from a Dutch bank, which was purchased to pay. And uh, she did her dissertation around there. Um, and it finished up being published in the Accounting Review and one of the system journals. So there are a couple of articles about it, um, published in 2014, if I recall correctly. Um, and then Tiffany joined our PhD program, and she did the dissertation using uh, these logs for internal control evaluation. So I'm just going to go over these, basically give you a background on process mining, which is very, very interesting. So basically, this uh, I'm going to just say that the purpose of this particular dissertation was to look at Variants. Variant is just a path of a transaction within the organization. Then looked at a couple, a couple of segregation of duties, employees, and duration of activities. And if you look at this, basically you say you have the, this is the flow of a document within. Uh, this bank to order purchase of something. So if you look at the left, you say the event was 1881, 8.45, uh, had a number of uh, uh, process instance 26,185, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what really gives you the interesting information is in the right side, which is basically the path of transactions on this purchase, uh, purchase to pay activity. Uh, when I saw this the first time, I'm an engineer by training, I said, ah, that's going to be 85, 90% of, of these uh, transactions that are going to follow three or four paths. And that was true when we found it. What we didn't expect was the very large number of variants that existed. And uh, uh, Yunsen, who just finished a doctorate here last year, calls it a spaghetti path. And uh, this, this is actually the, the path of these things on the bank that we are examining. 
And if you, you can read these uh, by looking at how fat the line is. So you go from create a PO to sign, there are 5,037 uh, transactions that went that way. Or from uh, sign to G GR, from GR to IR, etc. Those are the common paths. But what you didn't expect is so many secondary paths. Actually, we continued analyzing this data set and we found something like 960 paths in addition to those main three or four paths. And we thought that eh, this might be an aberration and et cetera, but actually it wasn't. And as you can imagine, uh, this is Mochi, my dog, and he is enjoying the snow. Today is very hot out here, and he is sitting on top of the air conditioning. Okay, and this is just to entertain you that I always show this. Um, and uh, to particularly to accounting faculty, and I thought you'd be very interested on this. So what do students, before they join in professional accounting, think about the accounting profession? First, it's boring because it's accounting. Then it has very long, crazy hours. And then you get very little money. Boring? Well, Abby is doing all this work on robotic process automation. Let's basically pick up the stuff that is very repetitive and have a robot performing it. And the work of audit is being reframed and is becoming much less tedious. And another problem that is going to affect you all, but much less you than existing auditors, is that if who, what are these people that are being replaced by robotic process automation doing? And the other thing is, do you know how to do what this robot will be doing instead of you? Because you need to keep the basic competences. Actually, this is in accounting is a little bit of uh, uh, overstatement here. But there is a real concern, for example, in aviation of the skilling of pilots. Pilots are flying 80, 90% of the time in automatic pilot, and very often uh, they only take off and land. And the rest is done by automata. And so there is a real this concern about how many, you know, they used to measure the experience of a pilot of number of hours of flight. And Actually, the numbers that they actually are touching and controlling the airplane are very few. And so they have this concern, well, if they don't do very much of this, in a moment of emergency where automata fails or is not available, do you know how to drive the plane? And actually, the question of reskilling after complex functions are taken away from humans is a very serious question in many, many domains of, of activity. Uh, so that, that was it for tedious. You are eliminating robotic, uh, eliminating repetitive tasks um, and rethinking how you do the audit. Now, hours, basically you started the kind of, the reason why the hours were very, very long, particularly in the peak period, is because you had to basically evaluate at the year end the balance sheet accounts. And those balance sheets accounts uh, took basically most of the effort of an audit. And today you're kind of rebalancing the audit, trying to include a little bit of continuous audit, just starting um, some automation. And changing the method that you are performing the audit. Now, pay uh, is actually just in very simple terms, 
what's happening is first, it used to be like one staff member, no, one partner for 12 staff members. Very narrow, very, very narrow triangle, um, whereby, whereby there was this kind of career going upwards to partnership, and there was a low probability to make partner. And what actually happened with all of the larger firms is that this became much less of a street triangle. And there is a lot of uh, non-partners for life staff working on these firms. And actually people are predicting an inverted triangle or something much less steep in the future. And so there, there'll be, they expect to be analytic specialists, uh, computer specialists, telecommunication specialists that work in the firm, are managers for life. And this is kind of interesting how, they, uh, how this is going to evolve. Uh, one more thing that I need to, to tell you, typically when people ask me, what is the compensation? I basically say, oh, you leave with sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year, but that's not what's interesting. What's interesting is that typically in CPA, in the bigger CPA firms, in six years you double your salary, and in the next six years, when when you're becoming partner, you double it again. So you started with let's say sixty thousand uh, dollars, you double your salary, hundred twenty, uh, in four years you'll be making. 240 plus. So there's a big difference. And when you look at present value of the salary stream, if you are successful in the profession, it's very good. So it's not so boring as people think. Um, technology is leveling off, making the peaks less peaky in all working hours. And salary at the end is reasonably well. And compensatory. Uh, just little joke or whatever you want to call this. Uh, this is Mochi, my dog. And uh, I worked for a year and a half with the Brazilian Central Audit Office called the TCU um, for doing audit analytic work with them. And after one year, they told me that they couldn't share the data because the data was private. And they gave me a medal of honor of credit of Brazil, big medal, like president gives it, et cetera, et cetera. I got so annoyed that I put the medal on Mochi and he didn't like it either. You can see he's looking very, very distressed with the medal. Okay, so I will stop here for a second because I hate monologues. And I just want to hear from you a little bit. Before I start, I want to speculate a little bit. Claudia, what do you think is going to be the future of audit? What's going to be happening with the audit profession? Um, <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Okay, good. Um, in my opinion, uh, audits are going to be taking place remotely. I think nowadays we're seeing it more, more. It's more evident uh, as as we're going through this health crisis. Ultimately, you know, even small businesses to medium sized businesses are going to transition from paper uh, records into digitalized records, which obviously would um, improve the the audit process for many of the auditors out there. I think that's one of the major limitations uh, at the moment to to continue with this path um, into into having remote audits. I think so companies that, are still working on even the scanning audit. their documents to be able to provide this benefit uh, to the auditors who eventually could help them even improve their processes. So you think the remote audit is the major effect? I think yes, definitely. Uh, even even nowadays, uh, I, I'm seeing it. Uh, audit auditors don't want to come on site for one, you know, for safety reasons. Ultimately, is is less efficient for them uh, to do one or two audits per day versus I don't know four or five. So as far as efficiency, it would allow them to to get better at what they do. Thank you, 
Claudia. Jennifer, what do you think? Man, why you got to call on me all the time? <laughs> because you are so charming. <laughs> Aren't you going to see enough of me later? Anyway, um, <laughs> I mean, audit obviously is going to have a lot of its bits and pieces taken care of with all the technology that's that's being thrown at us. And and the more we figure out how to use it, we're going to be able to 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 brush away all the little BS tracking down invoices and to deeper analyses. Now, what those are, I haven't gone to school for accounting long enough to tell you exactly what those will be. But um, we'll definitely get a lot more complicated, a lot more detailed, and provide a lot more valued clients. Good. Let me ask one more person. Matt, what do you think is going to be happening? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I think a lot of the processes, especially with um, big four firms and some of the larger accounting firms, are going to try to be streamlined across multiple clients so these firms can take big data sets and apply all the data towards um, the information they're getting from the clients. And I think over the next 10 years, we will start to see artificial intelligence integrated into audits. But the step to get there, like we were saying before, they have to learn to use this data that they're getting their data, this data that they're using into the audits to um, better give the client. Okay. So, let, yes, go ahead. Come I actually on. have a question. So, like, companies that are using like continuous auditing, like, how do their auditors differ from like other companies that are just like traditional? Okay, first, first, I don't think too many companies are doing continuous auditing yet. But finally, in the last two, three years, I witnessed substantial changes. Actually, uh, two of the CPF, actually, I said two years, maybe four years. Um, two of the large CPA firms, one of them PWC, is actually has entire practice dedicated for continuous auditing. But what they actually do is not continuous auditing of external audits. What they do is they consult um, internal audit departments to help them to create a continuous audit function. So the external audit, the best I can ascertain, I haven't seen one external audit using some idea of of continuous audit. And I think the main reason is that uh, the standards are very tight and require a reasonably anachronistic passé audit. That's uh, that's really what it is. And I think there'll be a need, I don't know if it's going to be corona, but some major shakeup on the environment to start doing a 21st century audit, which you're going to hear me talking about in a second. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start with the concept and then I'm going to finish with one long, long, long slide. And then I'm going to do a couple more things. Okay, so this is something that I always say, I think I mentioned to you before. Uh, when I was doing my PhD uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, there was a very famous study, Ball and Brown published. And basically what that study did, it picked up accounting numbers, looked at company valuations, like how much the stock market is valuing the company, and linked the, each other by running a regression, a multiple regression eventually. Okay, and that basically, and you already had a little bit of regression from, from Abby, um, and that basically gave R squares of 60%, 70%, 50%, which basically said accounting numbers explain good part of the valuation of the company. Now, you know what's happening now, 40 years later? The questions on as sophisticated as you can do today explain 4 to 7% of the valuation. So basically, 
markets are not looking at financial information um, as a major valuation tool. They are looking at many, many other things. Um, and so my question that I ask is, if this information, the accounting information, is not so relevant, meaning for valuation, what's, why are we auditing it? Who cares? Okay, I, I can answer my own question uh, in speculative form. Um, who cares? Uh, you know, in the, before the Security Act of 2034, there were companies trading in the public markets that literally did not exist. They just sold stocks and eventually disappeared. Today, that's not possible because auditors go there and see that there are people working, there are materials coming in, materials going out, or whatever. Okay, and so some validation by auditors, there is value to that. So it's not totally kind of a use, useless thing, etc. Now, one other thing that's happening is that 85% of the Standard & Poor's 500 report non-GAAP information. What is non-GAAP information? Uh, I'll tell you in one second. 35% of that is audited, is assured. But there is a lot of kind of blah, 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 uh, what they call greenwash. is saying I'm doing all these things in sustainability, but this is basically marketing talk. Now, these non-GAAP information, uh, like sustainability, integrated reporting, um, are progressively getting bigger and bigger in financial statements. And eventually, they'll be more reliable. The other thing, let me kind of call your attention to it, is when um, the current accounting model uh, that evolved from uh, Faluca Pacioli's work in the late, late 1400, he published his Summa Mathematica in 1492. At that time, the concern of running a business was basically inventory carrying, sharing profits, and debt. So there's the three things. So basically, double entry was good for that kind of thing. We keep that model until today. But today, you have virtual goods. Uh, you have the complex businesses operating in many countries. You need other things. How does business cope with, with that? It doesn't cope with double entry. It copes by uh, installing an ERP like SAP or like Oracle and having human resources information, uh, patent information, um, supply chain information, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the information set is not only financial, is all kind of other variables. And then typically my students ask me, um, and how come that information is not provided uh, by companies? And you know, that my answer is always, do you like to be graded? They don't like to be graded either. So what do they do? They provide the minimum information set that they can. Sometimes they provide a little bit more uh, because they are trying to uh, enrich the company. They are trying to make themselves look better. But companies like uh, oil and gas producers are now required to disclose reserves. And pharmaceuticals are required to tell what they are doing in in IP development, intellectual property development. Uh, so products that they are developing, patents that they are getting, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but why uh, is our financial report so narrow? Because the profession defended itself and limited what information is required and created some very arcane rules that make uh, merging it with other information sets very difficult. So this is what's happening 
uh, with, uh, with reporting. And of course, the question again is, why are you going to pay for the audit of information that's not very good? The bottom, my last bullet there, is the reason why I am more optimistic, is there are many other services that cover other information sets that companies are providing that eventually need to be validated. Now, this function of measuring, don't measure it, you can't manage it. And if you don't assure it, you don't believe the measurement you get. It's not uncommon for companies going to CPA firms and asking them to validate certain parts of their business because a large international business, they have worries about reliability numbers that they get. So uh, I think that's why I think that there'll be a very large business for auditors on assuring things that are non-financial, and that's evolving reasonably rapidly. The one problem with that is that many of those assurance services are not being uh, performed by accountants. So it's not ENY that's doing that, it's some consulting firm. And so what I basically say that modern auditing is a form of meta control, control of controls and control of data. And progressively there be uh, a lot of predictive analytics associated with it. Now, that's another comment that's worthwhile uh, mentioning. Um, is auditing of the past was always backward oriented. I'm going to say a joke, but jokes this way don't work very well. They say the auditor is like the general that comes in after the battle and shoots the wounded. Why? Because the audits don't really have an effective usage of avoid errors uh, going to the future. Now, a continuous auditing can do that and can basically prevent bad data to go on downstream systems. And so we are going to basically start moving towards more predictive uh, audits more predictive data control mechanisms. So the modern assurance, the modern audit will be continuous in time, and continuous doesn't mean any nanosecond, it means reasonably frequently. And then we're going to be multidimensional, meaning in many different ventures, so many resources, intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera, a lot on ecological impacts, and et cetera. Um, and in order to do a continuous audit, you need a continuous monitor and collect this data. So the data collected is used for auditing, is used for monitoring the business. Lot of forward-looking analytics. Um, and I actually think that evidence out of process mining is going to be very, very important. On, and, and that's the reason I'm talking about it now. Um, and it's going to be really app-based. You have uh, all kinds of apps overlaid. Today, you know, you sell big systems for auditing or et cetera, et cetera. Progressively, these are all going to be little apps that you can buy on the corner store. I'm joking, but you can buy pretty easily, okay? And finally, and you see, this is not a spelling, the big, the big S, is independent reporting dashboards, meaning you're going to have a dashboard for management, a dashboard for auditors, a dashboard for the banks, a dashboard for certain types of investors. And because you don't need to print one report with 100 pages, mail it, and ex mail it physically, or et cetera, et cetera. Today, the financial report should be a multidimensional database with a lot of pre-tailored reports. But we are not there yet. I've been trying to look for a company that allows us to do that for that. 